So while, while Remy is finishing setting up, I'll just give a quick introduction to Dr. Mark River. We have a few people on the, online as well, listening in, and this will be recorded. Um, there'll be time for a few questions at the end, so uh, keep that in mind as we're listening to Mark. Uh, who's going to tell us, uh, you know, a bit specifically about GSE cars, the facility, but compress as well, and synchrotron radiation and the geosciences more broadly. Um, so we uh, thank you for coming. Mark uh, studied geology and geophysics at Harvard and got his PhD at UC Berkeley um, and has been involved in geoscience at synchrotron radiation sources uh, his entire career. was involved in developing X-ray microtomography as one example um, and has been involved in the building of GSE cars since about 1994. He's now, um, in addition to being a research professor at University of Chicago, is currently director of CARS, which stands for Consortium for Advanced Radiation Sources, and GSE CARS is part of CARS, and so he'll, he'll give us the details. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks very much. It's, it's really nice to be here. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, so I'm going to uh, a quick outline of my talk. So first I'm going to give a brief, brief introduction to what synchrotron radiation is for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, a little bit of the history of support from NSF for Earth Sciences at Synchrotron, um, and then talk about the two facilities that uh, Steve just mentioned, Jesse Carr and Compress, and then finish with uh, uh, thoughts for the future where there's a big planned upgrade as to Synchrotron at Argonne. <clears throat> so Synchrotron radiation is the electromagnetic, <coughs> excuse me, electromagnetic radiation that is emitted principally from Giga electron volt electron storage ring. So as the electrons go around the ring, they emit electromagnetic radiation, and that's what we're using uh, in our science. So it, it's not the uh, the particles themselves, but the X rays or other uh, electromagnetic radiation they give off. And, and the characteristics of synchrotron radiation is that it covers a very broad spectral range, uh, from actually beyond the IR um, up to very hard hard X rays. Um, the source is very bright, which means two things. The X-rays come out highly collimated into a very small opening angle, and the source itself is very small, meaning that you can, if you're imaging that source, you can focus it very well down to a very small spot. Um, so the, the, the collimated means it's got high intensity, lots of photons in a small angle. The small source means we can focus it. Uh, the, Polarization of the radiation is um, tunable, uh, and, and different sources have linear, circular, or tunable polarization. It, we often treat it as a DC continuous source, but it's not. It's a pulse source. And um, for instance, at the advanced photon source, the pulses are about 100 picoseconds long, um, which is about a centimeter at the speed of light. And um, and there are about 5 million of them a second. So it's, it's, you can treat it, you know, if you're doing an experiment that takes seconds, it's like a DC source, but we can do time-resolved experiments, pulp probe, where we say hit it with a laser, and then 100 picoseconds later, look and see what happens to the, to the uh, target. Um, and the, the source is partially coherent. Um, it's much less coherent than a laser, um, but the coherence is important than the new source that I'll talk about at the end, the upgrade will be, you know, 100 times more coherent than what we have now. So the, the radiation is coming out of these relativistic electrons in the storage ring. Um, the, the, the critical parameter here is this thing called gamma. At 1 over gamma, and gamma scales as the energy of the machine, times about 2,000. So 1 over gamma is approximately the full width half max opening angle of the synchrotron radiation. And there's another parameter, which is called the critical energy, which is just the half power point. Half the x-rays are above that energy, half are below, and that scales as the square of the storage ring uh, energy and linearly with the magnetic field of the source. So in the U.S. right now, DOE-funded sources, DOE basic energy science sources, there are three synchrotrons. The advanced light source at Berkeley, which has an energy of 1.9 GeV, 
So that's the low energy soft X-ray vacuum ultraviolet machine. NFLS2 at Brookhaven is a 3 GeV sort of medium energy machine. And the advanced photon source at Argonne is a 7 GeV uh, machine. And you see how gamma goes with these. So at the ATS on what's called a bending magnet, um, the opening angle is about 73 microradians, meaning that 60 meters from the source, the X-ray beam is about four millimeters tall. So, you know, it's way more collimated than this laser pointer. Um, and the critical energy there is about 20 keV. So it's a hard X-ray machine. We have lots of photons out to 100 keV and more. So how are X-rays produced? Very simply, this is your beam of, elect of relativistic electrons. This is what we would call a bending magnet, just a dipole magnet. As the electron goes around that bend, it emits radiation in a fan like the headlight on a train sweeping around the corner. Small opening angle in the vertical, that's that one over gamma, but a big angle in the horizontal. We also have in the straight sections of the storage ring periodic magnetic devices. This is a device called an undulator, and as the electron goes through there, it goes back and forth, back and forth, and the, the radiation from this pole, this pole, this pole interferes constructively and destructively, which leads to two different things. First of all, the beam comes out highly collimated in both directions. You know, orders of magnitude more collimated than the bending magnet. It also has peaks in energy. So it has, it's very, uh, it's, the bending magnet beam is, is a white spectrum, very smooth. The undulator has strong peaks and then no x-rays in between. And so this is a, 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 a plot of a figure of merit called brightness, which is just the, the intensity per solid angle divided by the size of the source and as a function of, of time. So X-ray tubes have not changed much. And I, I would point out that this is um, 18 orders of magnitude. Um, actually. So X-ray tubes are down here. Bending magnets are up here. Some devices called wigglers, which is like a bunch of magnetic magnets in a row, are here, and the undulators that I just mentioned are here. And yet another gener generation of sources called free electron lasers are up here. And uh, but I'm going to be talking about undulators and bending magnets. So uh, his history. This is the first. This was the national synchrotron light source at Brookhaven National Lab, um, and it was. Uh, came into operation, this is the x-ray ring here, in, in 1985. And um, it was the first dedicated synchrotron light source in the world. In other words, an accelerator built specifically to generate synchrotron radiation as opposed to one built to do high energy physics, and the synchrotron people were parasitic. Um, and uh, as I'll show on the next slide, it was also the location of the first geoscience beam line, um, and, and that was with NSF. And this machine shut down in 2014, and a new machine at Brookhaven called NFLS2 was built. So the, the first geoscience beam lines um, at NSLS were an X-ray microprobe, and that's where I work from 1983 to 93. And that was funded by NSF EAR, Instrumentation Facilities, Dan Weil, and it was built as an X-ray microprobe user facility. So, you know, people from all over the country came to do experiments on this facility. And, and it was funded by NSFEAR until about 93, and then the support shifted to DOE Geosciences, still run by the University of Chicago, but not through NSF anymore. There was also another uh, organization called CHIPPER, which this was a center for high pressure research that was Stony Brook, Carnegie, and Princeton, largely. And that funded geoscience research on three beam lines at NFL. A diamond anvil cell, a multi-anvil with Dave Mao, a multi-anvil press with Don Widener, and infrared spectroscopy with Russ Hemley. This was not a user facility. This was something where it was funded for so that group to use, but they weren't, they weren't mandated to provide access to the larger community. And that ran from about 91 to 2002. The, the science and technology centers had a five-year lifetime renewable one, and they did, and then that ended. So the next generation, the NFLS was built to use x-rays from bending magnets and wigglers because the potential of undulators hadn't yet been realized. But by the mid-80s, that, that changed. 
and people realized we really needed to build machines to use undulators because they are so many orders of magnitude brighter. So planning began for this new machine at Argonne called the Advanced Photon Source. And that started in its construction in 1990 and began operating in 1990. And to take advantage of that, um, in the earth sciences, Joe Smith, J.D. Smith at the University of Chicago, formed this Center for Advanced Radiation Sources to build multiple beam lines at the APS, one of which was to be in geoscience, but another in structural biology, and another in chemistry and materials. And he did a really good job of organizing the geoscience community to build the science case and also to help design what it was they wanted built there. So in uh, GeoSoil and VIROCARS got funding from NSF EAR back in about 1994 to, to uh, from both EAR and I should say about 25% from DOE Geosciences to construct and operate one of the sectors at the APS. And the sector there consists of both a bending magnet beam line and an undulator. And it, and, and it was designed specifically to be a user facility with multiple beam lines and multiple techniques for earth sciences. That's Joe Smith. This is the APS, and GFE Cars is located over here at Sector 13. At about well, a little bit later, Chipper um, ended and um, was encouraged to form a new consortium that would operate user facilities like the ones that, that uh, Carnegie and Stony Brook had been running, but as a user facility, as user facilities. And so this was, you know, you can view it as the Compress is the successor to Chipper, and it started around 2002. And its, its mission is, is um, uh, more limited than Jesse Carr's. It's mostly for mineral physics, in other words, high pressure research that's not strictly true, but in, in practice, mostly the truth. And it runs fractions of beam lines at this new NFLS2 ring at Brookhaven, at the Advanced Light Source, and at the APS, as user facilities. So at the APS, there are, it's funded, as I said, by DOE Basic Energy Sciences. In other words, they run the accelerator, and they run about half of the beam lines. The other half of the beam lines are run by groups like us, with external funds. Um, there are about 66 beam lines that can run at the same time, and then 35 sectors, where, as I said, sectors both a bedding magnet and undulator. Three of those sectors are run by the University of Chicago. Sector 13, Jesse Carr. Uh, sector 14, which is funded by NIH, and for structural biology, time resolved macro molecular crystallography, and then finally sector 15, which is funded by NSF chemistry and material science. And um, they also offer, all three operated as national user facilities. In other words, they're not facilities for the University of Chicago. You know, they're operating them for everybody. And it also, there are two beam lines at the APS that are partly run by Compress. And, and, I, and, and Chemac cars and Jesse cars are the only two sectors at the APS where NSF is providing the operating funds to run. And uh, Sector 15 just received word that they're going to get a $14 million capital improvement to, to double their undulator beam line, to, to build a second undulator beam line. Uh, so at Jesse cars, we run four, we have four simultaneously running stations. Three on, the, three on the undulator, two on the bending magnet, only two of these three can run at the same time. We give out all our time through the APS General User Program. We get our funding from NSFEAR, the lion's share. There's some from DOE Geosciences, and there's been some capital equipment money from NASA, but no operating support. We've got 11 scientific staff, four postdocs, and four support staff. We've been operating since 1990. And we have more than 800 user visits per year, people that are coming to the beam lines to do an experiment. Typically, they stay one to, one to three days, five days would be unusual. And we're producing over 150 publications a year. These are the techniques that we provide. So 
So there's an X-ray microprobe for doing trace element analysis and micro X-ray spectroscopy and micro diffraction. Uh, a diffractometer. These, these three stations are on the undulator. These two stations are on the bending magnet. Uh, there's a diffractometer where we largely do mineral surface interface scattering. So what happens in the first few atomic layers of a mineral when it's exposed to a solution containing uh, a contaminant? Uh, and then we have the high pressure program in this station that has both a, a laser heated diamond anvil cell to go to very high pressures. And we mostly do diffraction, some emission spectroscopy, and then we have a multi anvil press uh, that can take a much larger sample, not to as high a pressure. On the bending magnet, we've got a small version of this multi anvil press. We've got a diamond cell that mostly does what's called free one spectroscopy, so inelastic laser scattering and commuted microtomography. And then finally, on a bending magnet, uh, another bending magnet station, we have a program to do diamond anvil cell, mostly single crystal diffraction, and also we can do interface and powder diffraction there. So I'm just gonna give a couple of examples. So this is what we can do on the, on the microprobe. So our microprobe is unique for all hard X-ray microprobes in that we can get down to the sulfur K absorption. So we can do sulfur spectroscopy, um, as well as you know trace element imaging all the way to the periodic table, except for elements much lighter than sulfur. And and so this is a sort of a megapixel map where you're seeing not just the total sulfur concentration, but in in uh, green and red, the, uh, the speciation. So you can tell the difference between sulfide and sulfate. And you know this is important if you're trying to interpret, so interpret sulfur isotopes in rocks, trying to figure out is this differences in, in the primary water chemistry or something due to geochemical alteration after deposition. <clears throat> in the, at high pressure, this is an example of the kinds of experiments we can do at you know into Earth's core conditions. So this is looking, you know, studies of what's the light element in the core and what happens if you put iron and carbon in a diamond anvil cell and heat them up to you know 5,000 Kelvin and to pressures of two megabytes. And and so looking at the stability of Fe3C versus Fe7C3 and metallic iron. And so the conclusion of this study was that you know this Fe7C3 could be uh, a, a, a present in the inner core in equilibrium with metallic iron. So you know this is these are very <laughs> challenging experiments to do to be at these temperature and pressure conditions. And to do that, we only have a very small sample, so we need a very high intensity focused X-ray beam to see what's going on. So you know these are the diffraction peaks that we're measuring. And then when it melts, that you lose the diffraction peak and you get this diffuse scattering signal up here. This was a recent study not, uh, not done at synthetically high pressure, but this is looking at inclusions in diamonds. And this was the first time that um, ice 7 was found um, in nature. Um, so this was ice 7 trapped inside a diamond that was carried up from the mantle. So, you know, it, it looks like pretty good evidence that there was liquid water present in the mantle at the location where this diamond is. Because it's a pure phase of water. Uh, it, it, and it crystallized I-7 presumably on its way up when it passed into the I-7 stability. Okay, that's all the time I have to talk about <clears throat> the science we're doing right now. Let me just talk a little bit about the funding. So at Jeffy Cars, our funding comes uh, largely from NSF or science instrumentation and facilities. It's about 2.8 million a year, and we're in year three of a five year award. Um, we had been co funded by DOE Geosciences uh, to the tune of about 25% ever since our inception. And it, and it was viewed, I think, as, as a model partnership between NSF and DOE. But, and it was about 900K a year. Um, but in August of 2018, Basically, I think the DOE science programs were told that they should end their facility support and, uh, you know, only fund science programs. 
Program manager, on the other hand, has said that he is he would be interested not in funding operations, but in funding technique development or science proposals, and would, would be able to entertain up to three of those at something like 300K a year, which would get us back. And so we followed up on that. We've already submitted our first one, and it's been funded. And the second one has been submitted. We're waiting to hear. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that we're going to get back to the DOE funding that we had in the past. But it's, it's not a certainty. And I want to say a little bit about user funding, right? So a large fraction of our users are NSF funded. And these individual NSF awards um, are key to the science that's done at the facility, right? We wouldn't be able to do very much science unless these users were being bringing in great ideas, bringing in graduate students and postdocs. And so their funding is key to what we do. Uh, and, and, and over about 66% of our users are grad students and postdocs. Right? They're, they're typically the, the senior faculty are not the ones coming to the super trial. It's the exception. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to now switch gears a little bit and talk about Compress. So Compress operates uh, a number of programs and projects, and I'll just go through these quickly and, and focus on the more important ones. So the bigger ones. So they operate half of a beamline at the advanced light source for diamond anvil cell diffraction, and that's a sub-award to Quentin Williams that you see Santa Cruz. They operate half of a bending magnet beamline at the APS for multi anvil work, and that's a sub award to Don Widener and Matt Whitaker at Stony Brook. They operate a smaller fraction of a multi anvil beamline at NSLS2, maybe 20%. They operate about half of a, of, of a beamline. They help us operate one of the Jesse cars. Uh, beam lines where we were only doing surface and interface scattering there. We didn't have the staff to, to help to do diamond cell. Compress is provided to staff that let us do diamond anvil cell single crystal refraction. Then uh, on a, um, they, they fund an infrared beam line at NSLS2, 50% of an infrared beam line. <clears throat> a small amount of an inelastic X-ray scattering and MOS power beam line at the APS. And the other things are, those are the beam line projects that they have. And the other one is they help fund our gas loading facility at Jesse Cars because we do a lot of gas loading for people other than Jesse Cars for the rest of the community. Um, there's a project to develop multi anvil cell assembly at Arizona and uh, a number of, of smaller, these, these programs are here are things that might only have a lifetime of a couple of years. Right? There's, there are projects to try to generate new infrastructure or new uh, outreach. The other thing that Compress does is they run an annual meeting and, um, and, and bring in the, the whole community goes to this and it's where we talk about what are the directions for the facilities. I happen to be the chair of the Compress Facilities Committee right now. I think by the end of my current term, I will have been the chair half of the existence of Compress. Um, and and this, this meeting, I should say, is important for Jesse Cars, right? We go there and we don't have money to run our own annual meeting. So we sort of piggyback on this annual meeting that Compress holds. Uh, they also fund a number of workshops. This is just an example of one that was for sort of large volume, lower pressure, uh, techniques that would be more useful in rock physics that was held at the APS recently. So there, Compress is very, uh, you know, has, has funding that's dedicated to funding workshops on uh, either training on existing techniques or uh, exploratory workshops on future techniques. Say a little bit about the relationship between the two because, you know, NSF is funding them both. Uh, NSF EAR is funding them both. So we've worked very closely together for many years. As I said, I will have been a member or, or chair of this facilities committee like half of the time. And our high pressure users are a very large contingent of the people who attend the Compress annual meeting. Compress, I already mentioned, is funding two projects right now at Jesse Cars. Uh, and we're going to, at, at NSF urging in our proposals, in our uh, Renewal proposals we received three years ago or so. They, they 
suggested that we uh, contemplate merging the two organizations. So we're going to hold a breakout session at this upcoming annual meeting to discuss <laughs> that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, you know, when we went to visit NSF, uh, the, the leadership of Compress and me, I went to visit NSF last fall, it looked like they were no longer pushing for this. They realized that the cons probably did outweigh the pros. But we're going to still have a, I, I, we want to hear what the community has to say about it. Okay, and now I'm going to finish up the talk, uh, talking about the future of uh, a, a major project at the APS. So there's there's a big, um, uh, it's called the APS upgrade, and it's what's called a multi-bend acromat upgrade. Basically what it means is they're going to replace the entire accelerator, which is 1,100 magnets. I mean, it's 1.1 kilometers of close pack magnets. And it turns out there's a new design um, where you can increase the brightness of the ring by making the electron beam much smaller um, if you do um, like a hundredfold increase. And I'll show that in the later slide. So this means the APS will shut down for one year, sometime, starting sometime in 2022. Um, it became an official DOE project, what they call Critical Decision 2 this year, and it's got an $815 million budget, which is more than 50% more than it cost to build the APS originally. Um, but it's going to have this enormous gain in science, science capability because it means that you know we can put 100 times more x-rays in the same focal spot size that we have today, or we can make the beam 10 times smaller in both directions with the same number of X-ray in the spot. Uh, to take advantage, however, we're going to have to replace our beamline optics, uh, mirrors, and monochromators um, to take advantage of that increase in brightness. If your mirror has, you know, slope errors in it, wobbles in it, not perfect, it, it doesn't preserve that brightness, and it's a real challenge because the beam is 10 microns, 60 meters away, and so your slope errors have to be less than 10 microns divided by 60 meters, which is nano, yeah, nano radian. Um, and we have to get better detectors. So this is where NSF, um, you know, support is important because the APS isn't going to do all of this for the partner beam lines like us. They'll do it for their own beam lines to the extent that the project has money for that. But is there a synergy free. between the mirrors and monochromators for those other, uh, the other uses, like the use for DOE would like to Yes. Yeah. Yes. We all. Well, would go to the same vendors yeah, to, okay. to buy these things, which is itself potentially a problem. Because they're, uh, you know. At the same time, the APS is do well. I should say, right now, the European equivalent of the APS, the ESRF in Grenoble, just shut down to do this same thing. Right? So they're buying all their optics right now. And then uh, the, the Spring 8, the one in Japan, is going to do the same thing. So it's going to be. Is there a supply problem? Then? I think there's money to be made, and 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 it, it, there are vendors who are pushing to be able to get their metrology good enough to meet this demand. So I, I don't anticipate a crisis, but it might be of some delay. You know that you can, already mirrors like they might take a year to deliver. Okay, so this is just illustrates. This is what the electron beam now, not the X-ray beam, but the electron beam in the in the ABS accelerator looks like this right now. It's a pancake. So it's like 10 microns vertically and 250 microns horizontally. This new lattice, new way of ar uh, arranging the magnets changes it to look like this. So it's essentially now a round source. So when you try to image this onto your sample, you can, you can focus the beam really nicely in the vertical, but you get a blurry focus in the horizontal because it's so big. But once we do this, we can focus it very well in both directions. So on that figure of merit that I showed you, uh, you know, today we're in this 10 to the 20th down 10 to the 19th range. We're going to be up here with the with the upgrade. And this is a plot that just shows more sources uh, comparing. For instance, these are the undulators at Brookhaven, which is a very low emittance machine, not as good as the APS will be. But you can see that, um, and this 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 black line is the APS today. So the NSLS2 is a preferred source below 20 kBV. 
But with the upgrade, the APS will be the preferred source over the whole energy range from you know, 5 to 100 uh, kV. So a few examples of you know, what is it we're going to be able to do with this upgraded source. Uh, the first, and I have another slide on this, is, is terapascal studies in the diamond amp system. Uh, so we've already got the technology to push the static pressure up by a factor of five. But the, but the size of the sample that's under that high pressure condition is submicron. And so we need to be able to focus the beam down to submicron if we're going to just measure the stuff that's at high pressure. For spectroscopy, uh, and, uh, you know, we're being able to push right now, our microprobe is at about two microns spatial resolution. We're going to be able to get to sub 500 nanometers, probably sub 300 nanometer uh, microprobe, and uh, to do these, these kinds of experiments with greatly enhanced um, sensitivity. And uh, surface and interface, you know, we do a lot of this work that we do on surface and interfaces, the beam has to come in at grazing incidence to the mineral surface which means it spreads out, which means you need a big crystal. And so that really limits the kind of, the kind of minerals we can study because we need to be able to find some mineral that makes two millimeters, three millimeter crystals. And that throws out a lot of, you know, a lot of minerals that just don't make crystals like that. But if we can get it down to 300 microns or 100 microns, it now opens up you know, time to time. So this is a, a illustration of what we've done today. So this is a diamond anvil cell and, and conventionally you would squeeze the sample between this diamond and this diamond. But instead what we do is put two nano diamonds in here and the sample just goes in between those. So it's like a double stage uh, diamond anvil cell. And with that we've, we've gotten gold to one terapascal. Right? Um, Ten uh, megawatts. But the only thing we, that was, you know, in order to get a good enough scattering signal to see it, it had to be gold. Or in this case, it was really, uh, you know, very high density, very high atomic number of material that scatter X-rays really well. But we want to be able to do this with SiO2. And for that, you need to be able to put many more X-rays into that small spot. Yeah. And finally, I'm just going to finish with Carl Agee sent me uh, a few slides, uh, a couple of slides on, you know, what compressed views as what they might, directions they might want to go in the future. One of which is dynamic compression. The, the, the uh, high pressure experiments that we've been doing um, at the synchrotron have largely been static high pressure, right? Either squeeze something in a diamond cell, squeeze something in a multi-animal thread. A lot of important natural processes are not static. They are dynamic collisions. And also, with dynamic compression, you can get to states that you can't reach with static. Right? So if you want, even, even if it's only for a microsecond, you can get to pressure and temperature regimes that are not accessible by static. And um, there are a number of dynamic compression facilities around the country. Um, they, uh, they, they range from laser facilities at the National Institution Facility at Livermore, an Omega laser, um, uh, an electromagnetic uh, pulsed machine called the Z machine at Santia. There is one uh, beam line at the APS that does dynamic compression. Both They have both gas guns where they can shoot a gun at a target and hit it with an x-ray and intense lasers that they can pulse and do dynamic compression. And then finally, the LINAC coherent light source uh, which is a free electron laser at SLAC, um, has a facility for doing high power laser pulse experiments, um, you know, with a, with a visible or IR laser to compress the sample and then an X-ray laser to probe the sample. And, you know, th these are facilities where the, the earth science community has only just barely gotten involved, right? And, and we could have much bigger grants. There's probably important science. How are these funded? All the others? Uh, yes. These are, well, I'm not sure who funds Omega. Uh, that, that might be NSF. Is that not. Rick? Uh, is that? Rochester. Is that Rochester? Rochester. Yeah, I'm not sure who funds The only non-NSA last year. Yeah, yeah these, these are all funded by uh, 
Well, is, does MMSA fund, they fund the, that end station that they're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. So they're not oh. user facilities, except domain. Well, 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 Slack is, right. right? You can write a proposal to do. And, and there is a, um, a person there who has a science background who works on that station periodically. Okay, let me just finish up. So I think summary, synchrotron sources are critical resources for geochemistry and geophysics. So there's a large part of the community that are using these today. NSF Earth Sciences has a strong history of partnership with DOE BES in facilitating Earth science access to these powerful machines. And the APS upgrade promises two more decades of frontier research. Thank you, Mark. So we have a few minutes. <laughs> Just a quick note, guys. If you're going to ask a question, there's a little piece of the polycom in front of Doug. There's the polycom, and then there's other pieces of polycom. It's all the way up by Remy and Mark. So lean in and speak loud. <clears throat> So I understand users who want to come and um, take advantage of the facility write a proposal for time, but they do not pay a user fee to access the instrument. Is that true? That's true. They they pay just their travel and you know the the, the cost it, it, it takes them to get there. So that's a little different from many other facilities where they do pay user fees. I guess I'm wondering what what is the rationale <laughs> for for that model? It's been it it it's been a subject of discussion um, with NSF. Historically, it was basically laid to rest uh, quite a few years ago when DOE doesn't want to have people charge a user fee to come there. Um, it's, it's not their policy that you have to pay user fees. Um, and, and MSF has, has accepted that. Yeah, that's an important point that the time actually comes from the DOE. Yeah, right. Right. So, right. I mean, if we were a, con a conventional outside partner, we would get 75% of the time to do what we want, and and we have to give 25% to the general user community. As it is, we give 100% of the time to the general user. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Some of the upgrades we'll do is for the APS upgrade are uh, obvious that you need to do them, but during the the course of your last award, you made some upgrades and new developments. I just wondered how you decide what to do, both in hardware and software. Come from the staff or the users? Or it basically comes, we don't have a very formal process for that, but it comes from interactions of the staff with the users. The users come and, and, and our staff typically are working with them all the time and talking to them about you know, what, what do they wish they could do that they can't do. And, and that's how most of that then you decide, or you, you have a committee? Or yeah, we have a in, internal in cars, we make those decisions. And, and if it's something that's going to take a big chunk of money, that, then it goes in the next proposal. Right? So we, we always have uh, forward looking um, projects in our funding proposals, um, you know, upgrades of equipment. It's a, it's a relatively small part of our budget equipment upgrade uh, there. It's on the order of 300, 350 k hours to point. Yeah. How does the timing of the upgrade mesh with the next time there'll be a recompetition for who runs the lab? Are there any complications there on the horizon? I mean, how much longer does Chicago LLC have uh, um, that contract? You know, I don't have that number on the top of my head. It wasn't that long ago that they it was recompeted, but you know, time flies, and I don't remember if that was five years ago or when that was. Uh, I don't think that that's probably a very big issue because the LLC is 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 important in implementing and and, and effectively managing the lab, but they aren't the ones who make decisions like did do we upgrade the area? So that's BES. Yeah. If Patel took over the management of the lab, that shouldn't affect the science as far as you're concerned. No, 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 not, not at all. And, and the management, for instance, at Brookhaven has changed over the course of the years. It, it didn't really, to my knowledge, didn't have a real big effect. It doesn't, certainly
ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਸਹੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਬੈਠ ਜਾਂਦਾ Oh no, I, I should have said no. Our, we're we're oversubscribed, significantly oversubscribed. The undulator beam line for the diamond anvil cell is like a factor of oversubscribed. And uh, whereas the bending magnet, it, it might only be 20% oversubscribed. Um, the and, and on the diamond anvil cell now we've got to the point where users get one day. I mean, almost nobody gets more than a day. which puts a lot of pressure on the users and on the staff that you know even a few hours of downtime is is uh, is not good and uh, but you know we try to satisfy we, we take as many people as as we can i mean we, we have to make a trade off between you know if you give people too little time they won't get the final done and then they have to come back again uh mark so compress which is in its fourth 5 year award i believe that sounds right uh is an EAR facility and yet there are several points of compress which are facilities and in almost 20 years now that we've had compress as a community consortium those several word facilities come and go yeah Not so often right so, so could you tell us briefly how facilities under compress are created or sunsetted sure um so as chair of the facilities committee every year just before the AGU meeting we request reports from each of the facilities that tell us you know how did they do in in the previous year um what are they planning to do in the next year so at a budget and so on and then we review those and um well the facilities committee reviews those and makes recommendations to the executive committee which is the decision making body in compress that advises the president and there have been cases where we have some that is facilities there was a diamond and built cell program at the NFLS uh at the NFLS 2 um that did not appear to be competitive and was uh struggling and so we decided not to support that um trying to think of uh, and and the facility to add single crystal diffraction at the APS um was a new facility that don't think I'm running for um about this year or so um that that responded from proposed so we compressed solicits proposals for new facilities and for new uh other kinds of projects they have an infrastructure Info IT infrastructure or education outreach and infrastructure development committee, which solicits smaller proposals each year for projects um, that, uh, like I said, it could be instrument development, uh, variety. But facilities are competed annually. Basically, yeah, they they are. They're they're, uh, and then of course. they're they're more seriously competed when compressed with the renewal proposal right because then it's not just the people on the compressed facility committee it's the peer reviewers who are who are passing judgment on what's been done and what's proposed to be done yeah. you you describe the the advances you will be making in the in your uh, facility can you say with that in a sort of general terms with that nail to do questions you could ask you couldn't ask answer now with that what where does that what does that get you to what are the the sort of big scale questions that this tech you gotten to now because of the technology yeah i mean i think i get one example is going to much higher pressure right i mean we can get now uh, with with pretty valiant effort but not impossible we can now say what what's happening in the core of and we can we can get to those but we can't get to the condition in a larger plan um which would be a good thing and we also can but you will or can yes yeah, yeah we okay. that's exactly that's what i was saying with this with this compound diamond uh you know technology and a much smaller x-ray yeah. to get um, to the condition 
one of the things that, I mean, one of the research areas that I'm in that I personally supervise is computed microtronics, so, you know, looking at 3D microstructure. And we're now beginning to do that in real time, right? Be able to do timers on measurements of fluid flow in porous beads. And um, so you know, we can image, you know, take a, a full tomography data set every five seconds. And you know, so we're not looking at ultra fast, but I'm looking at, you know, how, how uh, fluids are flowing through these porous beads. That's something that, you know, we'd be able to love to be able to push that time resolution down much faster. One more, one more yeah. question? Yeah. Quickly, sure. Given the hump of, you know, the high pressure you'd be able to go to with the new beam line and this double diamond thing, any thoughts on asking for NASA from partnership with NASA? Because this would really impact sort of what people think about it. Yeah, and we, we have had success, quite good success, in getting NASA to invest in new technology. Right. So one of the things that we did back around 2012 was we took our, our undulator beamline and we built two undulator beamlines. So the microprobe can run 100% of the time while we're doing the diamond anvil stuff. And NASA paid a third of that, which was like $700,000 right, that NASA put in. We have current NASA funding for, that's aimed at developing technology for sample return. Because right? you know, this is a great place to bring a sample when you first bring it back from another body. Um, where we have not had success is getting NASA to support operations of the facility. They really don't have a program that's aimed at that. Um, it would be, I, I, I wish they did. We, we certainly think that there are a lot of NASA investigators who benefit from RB1. Yeah. So we recently learned about the development of the exascale aura at Oregon. Right. Is that going to have any influence on your on the science that you can do with Jesse Carr? <clears throat> That's a good question. I mean, one of the things that's happening even today, but it will happen even more with the idea of upgrade, is we've got this flood of data, right? I mean, we've got detectors now that are pumping out. And I, I collected in the last round, well, this fast tomography I was just talking about, right? I mean, one day you get five terabytes of data. And it's, it's getting beyond, you can't just send users home with that anymore, right? <laughs> they don't have the resources to be able to handle that. So we need to be able to do it on site. Whether it's, it's aura uh, it, 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 is a good question because the whole model of the way those things, that DOE super good community facility work is you submit a proposal and you get time a few months later, right? And what we need is, you know, turnaround in real time. Um, but as they retire older machines, some of those are good enough for what we need. You know, we don't need 30,000 cores. We'd probably be fine with 1,000 cores. So, yes, I mean, data, data management, data handling is a big, a big issue. And, but, you know, the good thing is that there's, it's not just Jessica, right? Everybody faces in front. And some people are already using the facilities across campus, just because some of them have hit the data problem before we. Hey, Mark, thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome.